Welcome to the Rings of Power podcast, where the Lorehounds, your guides to Tolkien's world of Middle Earth. I'm David. I'm John. And I'm Marilyn. This is our coverage for Prime Video's original series, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, Season 2, Episode 4. In this podcast, we're going to start off with some notes about our coverage plans, our hot takes for the episodes, then we've got some miscellaneous notes and a short discussion of the opening credit sequence, and then we're going to get right into our detailed scene-by-scene breakdown of the episode. If you'd like to contact us, send emails to lotr at thelorehounds.com. By the way, that was misspelled in the show notes. It was L-O-T-D. So L-O-T-R, Lord of the Rings, L-O-T-R at thelorehounds.com. Make sure you send to that. Oops. Sorry. If you want to join our Discord server or support the community by subscribing with either Supercast or Patreon, check out the link tree in the show notes below. And if you're not into recurring subscriptions, you can find a link to our season pass where you can pay just a flat $10 and you get access to ad free episodes. You get access to the one guide to rule them all and uh, some other bonus material that we're putting on as well as all of their, our weekly lore casts. Good stuff. So Let's uh, breeze right into a little bit of our, our coverage plans. I just want to make a few notes. Um, the show guide is uh, happening. John, how's it going over there with the show guide? Oh, it's going your, great. Notion skills. We're, we're moving right along. I tried to figure out how to hide things so that I can preload them. For mm. uh, it, it doesn't work. Oh. And, <laughs> and it's, it's just going to have to be a manual after the episode drops. Oh. But... That's okay because you know what most of it's done already. We've got mm-hmm. we've got the uh, full recap done because that's what we're using for our outline and it's going well. We've got a lot of takers on the season pass and I think people are really enjoying it. So yeah, and I want to give a shout out to all of our new season pass holders. Wow, yeah, wow, thank you all so very much. I think we're gonna top uh, House of the Dragon easily with. Well, the- we already have. Yes, we have. It's very really exciting. Cool. Thank you to the new regular subscribers as well. So maybe somebody came around and they were like, oh, uh, you know, Rings of Power. Oh, uh, wow, look at all this other great content that these guys do. <laughs> it's like, there's a lot of podcasts. <laughs> so thank you, everyone who's subscribed, no matter how you uh, have subscribed. It's um, made the show guides a real success and it's making this podcast a real success. So we really appreciate that. Yes. The... A quick note about screeners. We are uh, gener- the Amazon was generous, and we are beneficiaries of screeners. So we're able to watch the episodes ahead. We're going to be very cautious about spoilers. So if <clears throat> some of us <clears throat> uh, have, I didn't ahead. do anything. Don't don't point your <laughs> rings over at me. Uh, <laughs> we will be sure to contain ourselves and not do the nya 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 thing. We just won't even pretend. We'll just pretend like we didn't even and see them. I mean, Wait. we we already have to be careful because the whole story was exactly. written fifty years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, like we gotta just we just gotta. Not spoil things. Right. Yeah, now, it gets tricky. Uh, one thing about the screeners, though, there's no <laughs> episode titles, so we don't know the episode titles before. There are no subtitles either on these. So there are sometimes a word or a phrase we might not catch uh, immediately, but that's just the um, the, pari- the price we pay for being able to get you guys podcasts immediately once the episodes drop or, you know, that once the embargo lifts, which I believe is 9, 9 a.m. Eastern. 9 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing they give us is translation of some of the languages other than English. Mostly they're giving us subtitles for Elvish. Yeah. Right, right, like, right, right. Spoken I got to tell you, there are some characters this episode that I do not know the freaking names of because the <laughs> subtitle, I just need the subtitles yeah. Yeah. for some Seriously. of these character names that Seriously. are just very quick. And so sometimes on the show guide, there'll be a slight delay in John updating that, but John is very diligent at getting to those things sure as soon as he sure can. Oh, John deserves props, my goodness. Yeah. And and as do we all, but let's uh let's 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 keep going on this because we got a lot to talk about tonight. We do. So uh really quick, we'll refer if you have any questions about our backgrounds. Marilyn's a scholar, John's a super fan, I'm a casual fan, any of our backgrounds and, and deep history about our relationship to Lord of the Rings, go back to the season two episode one podcast where we talk about that. 
And then for feedback, our dear hand of the pod, Nancy M, is on the receiving end of the emails. She's uh, collating all that stuff, putting in documents for us every week, and we're gonna have a lo- we're gonna have an email. Uh, feedback uh, episode out this week. We've got a bunch of uh, great feedback, so Nancy's doing that. She may contact you, ask you for some clarifications, that kind of stuff, uh, and we just we just are so appreciative of Nancy. She did a great job on House of the Dragon, and she's doing even a, a better job now for uh, the uh, Rings of Power. Yes, you can also send is. in voicemails. You can go to our website, and you can use the built-in system on the website, on the contact page, or... You can just open up the voice memo app on your smartphone and then email that audio file to LOTR at the Lorehounds, and then Nancy will integrate those into our uh, into our workflow. We're going to rely a little bit less on Discord feedback as we did a lot for our House of the Dragon. We're going to do that a little bit less. So if you really want uh, to share your feedback, make sure you send in uh, uh, something to the email. That's because that's really where we're taking uh, a first look at uh, feedback and such. All right, let's move into our hot takes really quick. Marilyn, what did you think of this episode, episode four? Well, I think we're really seeing the benefits of being released from COVID restrictions. I'm just so impressed. Mm. It's almost like going from two dimensions to three. We're finally seeing vast landscapes. We're seeing large crowds. We're Mm -hmm. seeing um, a lot more... Um, interactions, I guess, is the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to be six feet apart in a hobbit hole. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> and don't get me started about a barrow. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even worse. <laughs> even worse. I'm, I suspect that people are either going to love this episode or they're going to hate it, depending upon how they feel about lore. Because there's a couple of significant... Um, right. Events and characters. You know, um, Marilyn, if only there were a podcast somewhere that would help you understand the lore that you're encountering in the television show. David, what a brilliant idea. (laughs) God, we should monetize that. (laughs) We're doing our best. (laughs) John, what did you think of the episode? My favorite episode yet. Absolutely my favorite episode yet. And you know what? I talked to Alicia. It was her favorite episode yet. So Mm. I have backing. I have backing. We, <laughs> You've there are it. dozens of us. <laughs> the rule of two. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I thought that introducing the stores was fantastic. I really mm. enjoyed that culture. I really enjoy that the Harfoots have a reason for wandering. Yes. We're filling great. in a lot of backstory that I felt like we were missing last season. Really loved that. I think they are really showing their hand about what's coming this season with some of these ring visions. Mm-hmm. Which is cool. I mean, I'm I'm down for that. It's mm-hmm. it's cool, um, but I'm really excited to see it now because it, it seems like things are are coming that I'm not expecting. Yeah, I I feel as though they're doing a lot more foreshadowing this time. Yeah, and it, yeah. it keeps coming up to me. Like I think the Sauron stabby death is is a clear foreshadowing of a future event. <laughs> but the the thing I want to touch on the most is I am furious that they nailed Tom Bombadil. <laughs> I'm furious because I I came in and look, I try to be positive about these things, but Tom Bombadil was something where I was like, I don't know how they're going to do that right on screen. Peter Jackson couldn't figure it out. And then we kept getting told it couldn't be done on screen. And then in the trailers, I was getting really nervous because he was looking really glum. Mm. He was looking like he was in House of the Dragon, not Rings of Power. (laughs) And then we get to him, and he's just humming along, singing about his yellow boots. Mm -hmm. I was I was delighted. I was delighted by the entire Tom Bombadil sequence. It was largely pulled from the text, most of his dialogue, Mm -hmm. and I was I'm just ready. I'm just ready for him. And we're gonna do our lore cast on him, right? Yes, Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Bombadil was brilliant. If you've been uh, wondering too, whether oh should I get the season pass? Should I get the you know the lore cast? We're gonna be talking about Bombadil. And I even do a reading of Bombadil. A spectacular reading. <laughs> so either people are going to cancel their subscriptions or they're going <laughs> to no, 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 no. want more. Well, well, guess what, folks? Your season passes one time, so you can't cancel it now. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, no <laughs> refunds. Sorry. Oops. 
Well, I am mixed on this episode. Uh, Marilyn, like you said, people you know love or, or hate. I really enjoyed the first half of this episode, mm-hmm. even the Harfoot storyline, which you know has always been a little bit. But Quick, uh, follow the media. <laughs> one, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the introduction of the stores was very cool. But uh, I, I was even okay with the idyllic village trope, right? Which is one of the ones that just That's just a me. setting. That's not a trope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to yell this every time you bring it up. It's actually crazy. Uh, also, if anyone's allowed to do the idyllic village trope, the, the, the it's, Tolkien. it's yeah, Tolkien. It's exactly. Tolkien, right? The Shire. Yeah, totally. And I, I suspect that there are some aspects of that life that are not idyllic, but... Uh, uh, you, you know, know, medicine, yeah. uh, you know, uh, right, uh, clean right. water, you know, these kinds a of things. A good water You know, supply. wizards yeah. hunting them. Yeah, wizards, mm. <laughs> that too. Threats about what their faces are going to look like after, if they don't obey the great wizard. Mm-hmm. So somewhere around the back half of the episode, around the Southlander plot line, it just kind of started to come apart for me in different ways. And I, I, I really, mm. I, there are things, again, if I take individual pieces and parts. I'm like, oh, that's a great little bit. That's a little great little bit. But then when the gears all fit together, it just sort of kind of was a little bit awkward for me. And we'll talk about it when we get there. Mm-hmm. But like you said, this was another lore bomb episode. Stewers, the Barrow Downs, nameless things. Nameless things. Ents, like... Ents. Like, this was so much. This was a, was a ton packed into here. And it's hard to believe that we're halfway through this season. Good point. And what I'm going to be really looking forward, looking for now going forward is, okay, four episodes, a lot of setup. Now let's start to, um, uh, let's start to work through some of these issues. And, and are, are you going to be able to bring us, you know, to episode eight? Cause mm-hmm. if we have to wait another two years for the episode, like, oh man, that's going to be the, tough. And they've got a lot yet to do uh, for this episode. So I think based on the visions alone, I think we we are in for an interesting end of the season. Okay. Mm. Just just looking at the visions everyone's having, I'm like, okay, that's a lot of foreshadowing. Right. Uh, Definitely. To get done in the last few episodes. So I'm going to take a little uh, personal point of privilege here. And um, I watched episodes uh, six through eight of season one over the long weekend. Mm. Uh, uh, Ed and Nancy... They were giving me a little guff on the Patreon. Like, <laughs> you really shouldn't watch it. So I did. I did. And thank you, because I'm really glad I did. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> thank you, Nancy. I appreciate it. The I have some quick notes uh, that I just wanted to share uh, coming up, and I'll just run through these pretty quick. Mm-hmm. It Season one, episode six through eight, the pacing felt about the same. That I was kind kind of complaining about the pacing of season two. It's about the same. Like They feel uh, comparable to each other. Uh, and when... Season one, when it hits, man, it hits. It's fire. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then when they stumble, they stumble. But I think the stumbles outweigh our perceptions of the season overall. And so that sort of lumpiness in the season, I think, uh, does it a disservice. But boy, when it's when it's on, it is on point, And it's really good. Mm-hmm. The visual language is super strong across both shows and across the movies as well. There's so much going on visually. They are very attentive. I also watched uh, Lord of the Rings, Jackson's Lord of the Rings over the weekend as well. Oh, all of them? No, no, no. Just the first one. Oh, I was going to say. Yeah, no, not all three. You got a lot of time this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, and so there's a lot of continuity. They're really conscientious about that. And uh, I think yeah. they're walking a very, a very good fine line. Somebody wrote in, I think it's in our feedback, which we'll get to later this week, but they, somebody was like, oh, how, do I, how do I relate to these characters? And I was having the same problem. And something that I think helped me is when I relate to what I'm seeing on screen, as these characters are mytho-heroic characters, these are characters, even though they seem mundane to me, mm. these are second age beings. These beings exist in a time and a place and in a bigness that I don't relate to necessarily, even though they're being portrayed as people I could relate to or things that I, I could more relate to. And I think hmm. that's, a, that's like a, a little bit of a mismatch. I mean, if you just, if you lean back a little bit, squint your eyes a little bit and think of these as mytho heroic characters, hmm. then I think it will be, a li- there'll be a little bit more elevation of the story as mm-hmm. opposed to, oh, well, these are just people and I'm just watching, you know, Succession or something like that. You know, it's, does that make sense? 
It does. It, it sounds very similar to what Sara and I experienced when we were doing our Rings and Rituals podcast. Okay. The way we expressed it was taking them on their own terms. Mm -hmm. You exist in the context. <laughs> <laughs> or the interstices. Better than existing in the Matrix, probably. Yeah, it? probably. Probably. The last little general note that I had, and then a couple of key specific uh, episode notes, the whole identity of the Halbrand and the Stranger thing, that's done, right? They they did yeah. that to trick us. It's kind of a gimmick, and I think maybe a little bit of the, mm, the sour taste of season one might be because it was like we knew it was a gimmick, mm. and we were still all hooked, and then they did it. I am good. You know, that it was like... You know, I, and I think they've learned from that, but th but that was something that I noticed. It was like a little bit, oh, that was maybe a little bit of a sour note. Uh, I will say, we covering it week to week because you were, I recall, gone Traveling. for episodes like four right. through seven. Yeah, right. and I was watching them on mobile phones and right. Oh well, that's stuff, enough yeah. to make anybody crazy. So just yes. covering it week to week and and talking about it a lot with people week to week, we were not sure that Hal Brand was sour on even until it happened. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, there exactly. was still a lot of debate over who was Sauron. Is Sauron even not part of this story yet? You mm, know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I will say, I I think that the the flip with Halbrand was actually one of my favorite parts of season one. Okay, that's good. Mm. That's good. That's a that's a good good uh, recollection. Mm. Um, quick couple of notes. Episode six. That's a really key episode. It sets up so much. It sets up the relationship between Isildur and Beric. It has the seeds, um, uh, you know, the uh, Adar is mm. planting seeds, Galadriel plants seeds in, in episode one of season two. And then there's that scene where Adar is talking about the Uruk and the create and that yes. their creations of the one secret fire and all that. And I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Yes. It's a really, really good episode. And, and you know, it, it, it's very well rooted and pacing. Uh, it was just a great episode of television, period. And people were talking about it because that was the most downloads we ever had on a podcast. Oh wow. Was that episode? Yeah. <laughs> well, it was the one the most emotionally connected this whole question of orcs. Mm. And suddenly massive amounts of space and air are opening up and you're saying, "Oh, hmm. Gladriel right. the genocider." Oh. Right. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yeah, it's maybe it's a these aren't all real question. faceless red shirts. It's a real question. Tolkien struggled with it towards the end of his life, and they went for it. And I just, mm -hmm. I really admired their courage and their commitment to it. And I got to say, uh, something at the end of this episode kind of connects with that. Yeah, right. Right. Something uh, that I really actually mm. like, um, you know, just from this conversation we're having, is that. Galadriel is taking up this moral quandary that mm. Tolkien died in the middle of. Yes. And Tolkien was also in the middle of working Galadriel into the second age stories, the first and second age stories at the time he, he died. So it's kind of beautiful that this character that he was finally focusing on towards the end of his life is the one to take up the mantle. Of, mm, Let's answer this question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very cool. I, I hope just, we can do a lore cast on the on orcs as well. I think that would be a really interesting topic. Yes, for sure, for sure. That's right. They prefer I, uruks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> first, first lesson. Yeah, I can really see individual seeds. I'll use that metaphor being planted mm. that are going to lead to the Lady of Lorien. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm already seeing them. Great. Uh, episode seven. Uh, I think we. I didn't remember this very well, but. Man, Disa is super pissed at Durin the Third, and the <laughs> argument between the Durins is super, super intense and really destructive. Mm -hmm. And so I think it it kind of helped for me to remember how bad that was, how bad of an argument, and how mad Disa was. Even though Disa's preaching forgiveness this season, mm -hmm. she was pissed at her father-in-law, mm -hmm. like seriously. Yeah, they did a bit of a turn around that in this mm -hmm. season, I think, perhaps. Um, Again, this is one of the things that I think about frequently is relationships develop so fast, as we were saying earlier. This is one example of that. Right. That, you know, end of the first season, we saw Disa saying, that, you know, we're going to be king and queen of this mountain and this mithril will be ours and nobody can stop us. Ha, 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 Lady Macbeth. Suddenly in this season, she is the honored and respected stone singer. Mm-hmm. 
and she's talking with the king and she's giving him information and he says, yes, let's follow the advice of our stone singers and then afterwards tell me about my son and she wisely says, uh-uh, you got to talk to him. I'm not making a triangle of this conversation. And then, but then, meanwhile, she's preaching sort of temperance and forgiveness uh, behind the scenes and saying, of course. You, know, "You fix this thing." So, of course, yeah. Um, the barrack scene of um, um, oh God, Isildur's father, uh, Elendil. 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 Yes, thank you, Elendil. That's you one dare. to one. I not know. remember the name I of know. Elendil. I feel so bad. Uh, they they <laughs> lifted that one to one out of season one and plopped it into season yeah. two. Yeah, so it was it was an exact cut. Yeah, and then episode eight. I just want to keep going here so we can get on to because uh, we're going to talk about the opening credit sequence. The sequence af, uh, after this, mm -hmm. the just on the visual language thing, the raft that Salron or Halbrand and uh, well Salron really and Galadriel are on when she's having the vision. It, the way that it's designed looks like the the sort of uh, chamber uh, where he is, where he end up, he gets killed and that kind of stuff. The the way that it's spiky wood pointing out, it's the same. So they're really doing a consistent job making things look and speak and rhyme and sort of talk to each other across scenes and across seasons. So really, really uh, cool to see that. The um, Finrod's dagger thing, oh my God. Because it was like a little boat on a funeral pyre, and then there's like the, an eye swirl going on, and mm -hmm. just a, an exquisite scene. Mm -hmm. But really, I think the real key in episode eight is Halbrand touched the mithril. Halbrand Salron touched the mithril. He handed it over, but otherwise he didn't have a direct involvement in making the rings. He didn't, you know, you know, any secret. He just he touched mm -hmm. the mithril for a little bit, and then he was gone. And then Celebrimbor forged the rings. So right. Sauron was already uh, had already left the area right. by the tor time the rings were forged. So when he held the mithril and he put it in Celebrimbor's hand, he sort of held it for a second. In this season. In last season. In season one, Sauron. he touches the mithril, but he doesn't forge the rings. Right. He touched the mithril at one point. Yes, at one point, forged, very briefly, he right. hands so you're it saying over. he tainted it during he, that touch. But he did not, he slightly. was not able, to, uh, exactly. So hmm. he was not able to really do a lot of deep magic work on it. He only had it for a moment. Which he certainly had for more than a moment in this season. Right, and a lot of people have have pointed to that. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a, a key thing is why the Elven Rings are not, you know, at least in this show. In this show, I'm not. I'm not talking about the, the, the written words. In the show, that's why he may not have as much control over the Elven Rings. So, which is another amazing moral quandary of, you know, using potentially dangerous weapons. Well, I mean, all weapons are dangerous in some sense, but that kind of level of danger to accomplish good things. Right. You know, this ongoing conversation. And the reminder that Elrond contributed to the making of the Three Rings, but it wasn't until afterwards that he realized that Sauron was giving input into the whole concept. Right, the concept and, and design and, and whatnot, but yeah, but and not yet, the actual forging. Sauron needs Celebrimbor. Mm-hmm. And I find that interesting and a possible weakness to this. Why would he need Calabrimbor's skill? Mm. How could Calabrimbor outforge Amaya? Mm. Particularly Amaya, who studied with Aule. So, mm. you know, something to think about, I guess. Good questions. Okay, so those are my notes for uh, season one. And now we want to talk about the season two opening credit sequence. We're just going to kind of breeze through this really quick. I think think the analysis is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, so the first scene we see are of sort of a red colored sand that's a little bit more chunky, mm -hmm. and it's erupting from a central source, which sort of speaks to the Mount Doom, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, volcano aspect mm -hmm. of it. And then the red rocks start to flow out and bisect the gray sand it's kind of like almost like the tendrils breaking out of the Mordor area that we, we see on the map. Hmm. And then they flow out into a pattern. And at first, I thought that this was a sort of a Southlander heraldry thing. Hmm. But I caught a scene 
where uh, in season two, in this season, where we see Keller Brimbor's forge, and then I went back and I looked at the sequence, and this pattern is the forge, and this is yes. the red lava flowing out and swirling in these little cup mm. swirls that are on the yes. outside yes. to forge the rings. And then we get, um, uh, it was in this scene from episode three when Durin and Disa are visiting with Keller Brimbor. There's a nice, perfect picture of the whole thing, and you can see how it sort of matches up. And then, um, did, you, did you count the number of rings? Well, and that was the next. The next major image is the, a whole bunch of connected rings, and there's a string of nine that are connected, a string of seven that top. are connected, yep. and a string of three that are. Connected. Yep. Yep. So we get the twenty rings. Right, and then that pattern breaks and dissolves, and then I don't know what this one is. A I crown with seven stars. Well, just prior to that, we have the Numenor image. Ah, briefly. okay. Right. Right. And then it's a crown with seven stars, and I think that's the Doran's crown design that we see on yeah, the doors I of Doran. Yeah, I think Dordan. that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then we get some sort of circular design that I don't recognize. Is that the one that looks like the Eastern Goddess form? Uh, it's a circular design. It's kind of a sunfire-like design. I don't know where the okay. Eastern Goddess is. That's been used as the Numenorean symbol. Numenorean That's what symbol. I thought. Yeah, yeah. sun symbol. Yeah, sun symbol. Okay. The, the goddess image I'm thinking of, it, it, if you look at it with that in mind, it has a, a head, and then the two arms curve around almost like handles on a jar. Mm, okay. And then there's a sort of a implication of a body coming down below, and it's incised with these sort of zigzag patterns. Interesting. Okay, so that would be helpful if they had an image for the rune storyline in this opening sequence. Well, I sequence. think that's what this is. Yeah, because they don't. there's no other place that I see rune in this. Right, right. Yeah. And it's very evocative of um, uh, Mesopotamian and other, other goddess forms. Okay. And then I think that's pretty much it of the significance. Uh, there's, there's one other design. I think that I can't remember now. I don't have all the images in front of me. So, um, any other notes or thoughts? Well, I had a colorful sun shape following that goddess form. The sun shape is what I was thinking of. Okay. Well, then the goddess form is just before that. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so, if that's Numenor and then and it's I, got it's ringed in red, that's uh, you know that goes into the whole make Numenor great again. You know, w wear red for future. Oh, okay. It could also have been representing the east because of the powerful sun, but mm. I think probably what you said about the Numenor being something I noticed better. in uh, season two as well is when uh, Aarian goes to s to see the Palantir. She's mm. wearing red uh, in that scene. Mm. So yeah. Red is definitely something to pay attention to in this. Yeah, red seems to be season. the color of the uh, <laughs> of the Farazone uh, Farazoniites. Yeah. Farazoniites. Yeah, it sounds like a skin disease. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other notes for the opening sequence? If anybody's got anything more they want to add, send us a voicemail or an, an email. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for me. I'm going to look at it again and I'll add my thoughts to the show guide once I, I'm probably this weekend awesome. I'll have, I'll have a, a, uh, a guide to the it. intro in there. That'd be cool. awesome. Very cool. All cool. right. Well, why don't we take a quick break when okay. we get back, we will get into our full recap. And we're back. Commander Elrond is the first scene. Elrond and Galadriel struggle to settle into their new balance of power, but Galadriel accedes to his command. The small team attempts to travel to Oregion, but a critical bridge is destroyed. Galadriel sees that the hills ahead are filled with evil, but Elrond overrules her and sends them into the danger. So is this Mithlond, the Grey Havens? Yeah. In the Gulf of Loon. Yes. And I love that they decide that the Grey Havens has loons. Because, uh, Were there loons on there? Loons have special significance to us meaners. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> I didn't know they that were, there were loons in the scene. There were loon calls in the back. Oh, nice. Good pickup. That's yeah. great. Well, I, I could hardly not hear that. Yes, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I really like this because Elrond is trying to kind of 
work with Galadriel while also distrusting everything she says and kind of going with a, well, anything you say is tainted by the ring, so I'm not going to trust any of it. And it's <laughs> it's a really flawed approach, right? He doesn't I, even consider mm-hmm. that what she says is correct. Yeah, it's kind of hard to work with somebody when you tell them up front, I'm not going to trust anything you say. Exactly. I mean, how, how does that function? I don't, I know, I don't see that at all. Right. And Elrond is hard. <laughs> he is cold as ice. Yeah. Yeah, and they, they established that with one shot at the very end of season one. And so now it's almost the, the flip of what the relationship was before. Mm. And, uh, it, it gets painful. It really does. Which I think plays into future stuff, right? Into the third age stuff. Well, I'm not sure how. That's the thing. I mean, well, just in their, their general relationship to each other. They're, Which in, in the third age, it is definitely not harsh. And, mm-hmm. and oh, it's not. Oh, no, no. no, yeah, they're they're besties. Quite oh, I reverse. thought in the third. Why, okay, then I have a. They're bag. family by then. Yes, yeah, I know that, but that doesn't mean that you have that to mean be. Well, that's fair, along, but fair but point. they are no, they're they're definitely friends. Okay, you know, I didn't realize. Uh, for some reason, I had in my head that they are not, but that that's just something I must have made up. Well, there's a reason why, and I'll be interested to see how, if the show points towards the one critical softening that Elrond will have to undertake mm-hmm. or not. Because um, if they don't make that bridge to the Third Age, then I I think they'll be leaving a bridge sticking out into nowhere, okay. chopped off right, by right. the magic of Sauron, basically. Bridges <laughs> are not doing too well in this episode. I mean, they, they, <laughs> the not. path is not clear ahead. No. The AXA bridge, I did again, so lack of subtitles. I couldn't tell the name of this bridge. Does it, is there any lore check there? I don't know anything about it. Okay. No, you mean the bridge that they come to the end of and it's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's entirely a show creation. Okay. Cause he, yeah. it's named because the, the, like these 12 year old soldiers who don't look like they're battle hardened soldiers for a special forces mission. But that's ah, a they're elves. Point. Yeah. <laughs> they still, but still, um, the one map guy who is not the soldier guy, uh, he, he uh-huh. says, says something about the axe or, or is it Elrond? Somebody says something like about the axe bridge or, or I couldn't hear it. Well, speaking strictly from lore perspective, Evregion just was not that developed at this point. I mean, sure. they may be somewhere in the vicinity of the Shire right at that point. Well, according to the, the map, and then as they showed us on the show, and then when I was looking, I mean, they, they pa- they're on a ridge line. They see a big lake. That has to be Lake uh, Evendim. And they definitely have to pass through the Shire, and mm-hmm. that's the river that they're crossing has to be the Brandywine. The Brandywine, yeah. Because yep. if they're going to go down to the hills of uh, Tirn Gothard, if I can say that, Go Gothard, I don't know if I don't oh, say it. Oh, look at you. Don't Lose. roll your R's. People in our iTunes reviews are very angry at us <laughs> rolling R's. <laughs> that's right. Uh, anyway, let them the fuss. Barrow Downs, if they go to the Barrow Downs, <laughs> they have to be north of the Shire crossing the Brandywine. Right, and I'm kind of disappointed that they did that. I wish they had just made them some random barrel somewhere, because they're saying things like, well, yes, these are the dead men of a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. There weren't men there a thousand years ago. These are the kinds of things that I said, either they're going to love it or they're going to hate it. I can roll with it. It's what they did. It's fine. Um, Nobody else has ever betrayed, uh, portrayed barrel whites, and so fine. I think my my thing with this is, this is trivia, right? Timelines are trivia. Mm, they are not interesting. They are not. This doesn't change any kind of mm. m- character motivations or anything like that. This mm-hmm. is literally just, oh, this wouldn't have existed at that time. That's just a fact. You don't need sure. to like I'm I'm totally fine with them changing things like that to have a more interesting story mm. and have more interesting visual languages and and tie things back to the Lord of the Rings, especially because we didn't get Barrow Whites in right. the Lord of the Rings movies like. They are two things in this episode are things that we did not get in the movies that right. a lot of people complained about not getting in the movies. So, right. here, so now here we are going to complain that they did get them because they weren't their exact perfect vision. And that's not what I'm saying. Exactly. Right. So right. change up the trivia questions. That's fine. Mm. I, you know, as long as we are not changing who characters are fundamentally, I'm fine with that. Right. Well, I still think the whiteification of that elf happened far too fast, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Fair enough. It's a trap. It sure was. Uh, I just have to call out Admiral Akbar, but then I also have to uh, call out Duke Leto Atreides for saying that <laughs> knowing where the trap is, that is the first step in evading it. 
But they didn't do a very good job of eating it in this episode. So. Well, because, you know, Elrond made his decision. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, wonder at, w- at what point, if they ever are going to kind of say, well, yeah, actually, you were right, Galadriel. <laughs> 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 However, I mistrusted right. your information. It was still the right information. Yeah. Right. Exactly. He's literally just doing opposite day because he's angry at Galadriel. He's saying, oh, well, you mm-hmm. said this, so I'm going to do mm-hmm. that. And that's that's just an awful way to live your life, especially because he's taking her advice on something. He's like, sure, I'll take your advice for archers. But on mm. whether there's danger, he's like, no, you you may have way more battle experience than me, but I'm just going to decide my own thing. I'm going to do the opposite of what you say. Mm. And that's and not a very successful strategy. It isn't, particularly since she's known for her intuition, mm-hmm. and that will only continue to grow and develop as time goes on. And, and and this hubris got someone killed. It's more than one someone. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, can I just say, though, I am loving the costume changes for Galadriel. They keep oh, putting her golly, in these yes. really great outfits. And I just love the fact that main characters, a lot of times main characters just ride the same costume through the entire series or show, you know, season. And mm-hmm. nope, they're changing her up almost episode to episode. And I'm, I'm here for it. Her fashion sense is on point. <laughs> Absolutely. Shall we move on to the man of the hour? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't man, every duck. I love his subtle singing, but so the stranger yes. follows a goat to the home of Tom Black Bombadil. Philip, by chance. Sorry. Oh my God. I actually, Shades I want to bring that up. <laughs> All right. So the stranger follows a goat to the home of Tom Bombadil, who gives him only vague responses and songs. The stranger sees a branch on a large tree and tries to take it as a staff, but the tree traps him and absorbs him. You know, when, when they told me Bombadil was going to be in the show and then I saw the glumness, I think what I wanted was... I wanted him to be like kicking trees down as he runs through the forest and <laughs> bellowing his song. I think if you put me in charge of the series, I'd do a terrible job because that's what I would have done. I would have had him just stomping through the forest, you know, yell singing his song. Thank God you're a good podcaster. Seriously. <laughs> Listen, this is what we needed, right? This is just a quiet gardener, never giving you a straight answer, just singing his song softly. And mm-hmm. and being completely aloof yet so wise. I mean, that's that's yes. the perfect balance, I think. And demonstrating tremendous power at the same time. Mm-hmm. I have to say, Rory uh, Kinnear. I don't recognize him that much. I'm just looking at uh, some of his uh, filmography, and he's not been in a lot, a lot. And he is owning this role really he nicely. Is he absolutely delivers? Uh, so and let us also say he's mm-hmm. been getting a lot of good lines. Yeah, a some of them are Tolkien's lines, so of course they're good. But uh, there's a bunch of other ones um, that I made note of. We haven't gotten to yet, but we will. So uh, just maybe a quick note: we are going to do our lore cast this week on Tom Bombadil. Um, but just for a quick uh, historical note, I think. Bombadil's first appearance is in 1934 in a poem called The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. Yes, it was published by itself. Right. And then you can find it now in The Adventures of Tom Bombadil and other verses from The Red Book, which is a 1962 publication. And you can also find, I found it online. I found the whole poem online. And uh, I'm going to do a rendition of it for our lore cast. (laughs) I I read the whole thing, so it was a lot of fun. Yes. so we're going to have a lot more on Bombadil, but we'll talk about uh, the scene. Is there much more we want to talk about in this scene? I mean, there's not a lot here. I mean, they do kind of the whole old old man Willow thing here. Yep. I mean, yeah, they big time. they do. If you're if you're not familiar, just go read the two or three chapters of Tom Bombadil in the in the Fellowship of the Ring. He's there for a while. Like you you spend time with Tom Bombadil, and he's just completely absent from the movie. So. People who have not read the books are just completely sometimes oblivious to his existence. <laughs> but not anymore. Yes. Not anymore. And Can't overlook him now. Outside of the fact that he's in Rune, which I don't think has, has ever been alluded to before. No, but he's also eldest, so he could have done anything. He at could any have time. gone over exactly. anywhere he wanted over any period of time. Yep. One uh, thing. But I was just going to say that a lot, everything that you're seeing with Bombadil, like I, I was like, oh, what's this? What's that? I didn't know. I read the poem. 
And I was like, oh my God, like the, this is just, they're just pulling stuff straight up out of the text one for one and yes. just putting it into the scene. So the yes. tree swallowing um, uh, the stranger, that's, that actually happens to Bombadil in the poem. And mm -hmm. yeah, so. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, the bad wizard refers to Tom Bombadil as the hermit, mm -hmm. which made me wonder if this has any connection with Constellation, the hermit's hat. Uh -huh. which the stranger has been seeking. And then it occurred to me to wonder, maybe the stranger will end up with Tom Bombadil's hat. <gasps> oh. 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 What do you think? Because I don't see a feather in ring -ding -dillo, hat. It's Tom Bombadillo. It doesn't look like Tom Bombadil's hat that we see in the Shire. Right. Just saying. There's a feather missing from this hat. That's At the true. very least. And this one, the, the top, tilts back in a very distinct way from mm -hmm. another movie. Yes. Mm. Yes. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say what, what's going on with the goat? Why is it a goat? Because usually goats are used to symbolize a dark thing. Because sheep cannot survive in such territory. Okay. And you'd like to have goats for milk and cheese and whatnot. Do you know my guilty pleasure on TikTok right now is I've gone from hoof trimming videos to sheep shearing <laughs> videos. Oh, sheep shearing is fun. Sheep That's... shearing and llama shearing. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a whole thing. Did uh, John, did you get any uh, strong vibes of Yoda on Dagobah? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's a good pull. Yeah, and, and as well as earthy vibes, because what's in a name? You know, your name is your yes. own. It's yours to command if you want to yes. command it, and your staff is there for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're jumping ahead here. Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. I oh, okay. My notes. You I are. have my notes out of out of order. That I apologize. well, as I think I already said, uh, as soon as I saw the goat, I said, "Oh, Ged." Yes, Ged, <laughs> yeah. Ged the goat herd. <laughs> but I do have something to observe about the whole Star Wars association when we are ready to have that. Okay. All right, let's save it for In the House of Tom Bombadil, which is one scene away. But right now, we have to go to Nori and Poppy meeting a friend. Stores. Nori and Poppy wake in the wilderness of Rune and stumble upon another halfling who's never heard of Harfoots. They learn his name is Merrimack, or perhaps nobody, and force him to take, him, to take them to his home. There, they learn that the halflings there call themselves Stores and live in holes. The leader of the stores. Can I ask you too? What is the name of the leader of the stores? I could not get it straight. The, I, the grund. The grund. 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 Yeah, grund. grund. Remember, grund no something. subtitles. Folks. I need the goon, subtitles. Goond. I, I, I didn't have goond? an R in there. Goond. Yeah. The goond. Goond. I will have to wait until the next All right, the leader out. of yeah. the stores mistakes them for <laughs> allies of the Dark Wizard and orders them imprisoned. Meanwhile, the Dark Wizard tells the Razor the Dark Wizard tells the Raiders he will deal with the stranger while the Raiders capture the Harfoots. And I didn't state this openly, so I cannot claim any internet points, but I rather thought that the Whirlwind was going to carry the two Harfoots to the ruined version of Proto Hobbits. So Oh, yeah. I can okay. pat myself on the back because I, I figured that all you can have a bowl of cereal. That's fine. Oh, you can have great. Yeah. Wonderful. Make it, we'll it over and it's going to be a little soggy by the time we get there <laughs> <laughs> or limp. And I like the way the store music is both like and unlike the Harfoot music. Mm -hmm. Mostly the connection seems to be the hammer dulcimer. Okay. But um, it's definitely not suggestive to my ears of, of um, Irish music. And there's sort of a flavor of the desert going on there. But um, yeah, I thought, once again, the magic of Bear McCreary, I thought he did a good job with that. So you can believe, based on the musical cues, that these people do have this connection that we eventually find out about. That's cool. I didn't uh, get to that pull. I'll have to go back and listen to the, the music mm -hmm. and, and check yeah. the name of the leader when I check the name of the leader. I'm also wondering, and this is my Star Wars thing, I wonder how much of the Star Wars associations with Rune are due to the fact that it is so hard for anyone past post-1977 to see a desert situation and not think Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many of the series in that world use Tatooine at one point or another, and it just, it's almost a reflex right. at this point. I'm wondering if it was the same way with Lawrence of Arabia back in the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anything to do with the desert was a Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, because yeah. I got Lawrence of Arabia vibes. And the very first time we saw 
an image from Vroon of, of the, the horseman with the uh, banner riding across the desert at sunset. The whole mm. classic Lawrence of Arabia going on. So for all the people who are complaining, oh, it's just like Star Wars. Yeah, but think about how many other desert images you do or don't have in your mm-hmm. mind. And maybe there's a reason why that's what we go to. I think it's also because Mary Mack is about as smart as Luke when he starts off his journey. <laughs> <laughs> if everybody calls you nobody, doesn't anybody call you somebody? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> and, oh, so of course, we are shipping Poppy and, and uh, Mary Mack. Well, they were shipping each other. Yeah, yeah. They, it was a little on the nose, I thought, actually. Way on it the was, nose. A little, it was yeah, a little on too the ear. Sorry, John, the, the, the correct uh, turn of phrase <laughs> is on the ears. Okay. On yeah. the ears. The ears, the ears, the Stuart's ears are different than right. the the har- the Harf- okay. Oh, fair point. Okay. okay. Yeah, That's I just funny. thought it was a little overdone. Like, like be subtle about it at first, and then and then grow into that. Don't be like Ooglin and then have Nori go. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Nori. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, yeah that that was pretty funny. I do. I also I will say one other thing that was on the nose was I'm going. Harfoots living in holes. <laughs> I was yeah. like, all right, yeah. all right, we get it. <laughs> We're so, not stupid. Quick uh, stores lore check. I just did a quick scan of the uh, article on the Tolkien Gateway website. So stores grew facial hair and had an affinity for water, boats, swimming, and wore boots. Yes. The fall- So there's three tribes of hobbits. There's mm-hmm. stores, and then there's fallow hides. They were fair, tall, and slim. I'm just taking this straight off the website. Right. Um, and more adventurous, friendlier, and more open to outsiders. And then the Harfoots were the most numerous and instituted living in burrows. In later days, the Harfoot traits became the norm. Right. But something that should be important, besides the ear differences, is that among the Stuars, there were Deagle and Smeagol. Yes, the Stuars were the ancestors of Gollum. Yes. So, Gollum. Gollum. Also, you can find a very quick summary of this in Tolkien's own words. If you go to the preface to Lord of the Rings, where he writes concerning hobbits, and he breaks us all down. Mm-hmm. Which one? Uh, where is this again, John? At Sorry. the very beginning of Fellowship. It's okay. uh, it's the preface to the, the whole Lord of the Rings. Got it. He does a whole little kind of whimsical essay on hobbits. Okay, cool. And then Heart also he wants you to make sh- he wants to make sure you know where their pot came from. <laughs> <laughs> It's not pot. It is Nicosiana. He states it very clearly. <laughs> yeah, whatever yeah. PJ, whatever image PJ wants to have of him. Gandalf was all up in that secret fire. That's all I can say. <laughs> Sparking a Well, fire. you do you, John. <laughs> <laughs> My guy was red-eyed for 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hardy, That's why he hard, went back to the foot. Shire. It wasn't for the birthday party. It was that he needed to score again. Exactly. <laughs> they had the best, the best pipe weed in all, all right. the land. All right. Yeah. Let's go to uh, the House of really Tom did. Bombadil. Which, by the way, I titled this section in the House of Tom Bombadil because that's the name of the chapter in the Fellowship yes, of the Ring. Is. Yes, it is. Tom Bombadil rescues the stranger and sends him to take a bath. There, the stranger hears Tom singing with Goldberry, but Tom seems to deny her presence. Tom, as as cryptic as ever about his identity, calling himself eldest. Tom recounts when Rune was green and says he came to see the dust for himself. Tom tells the stranger he is not yet worthy of his name or staff, but they'll soon discover if he will be. They hear the raiders approach, and the stranger learns it's his duty to face both the Dark Wizard and Sauron. Yeah. So, are, how are you both on your theories of the stranger's identity? Because we have some, I mean, with the hat, that's like leaning one way, but then if he's got to face both, is he still a blue, or is, is he more Gandalfian? No, I think he's a blue still. Still, okay. I'm, I'm still on to, Team Gandalf. To, I still see nothing to contradict it. Okay. The hat? You don't think that he gets uh, Bombadil's hat? That's not a Gandalfian thing? No, it's They're a all wizard thing. Okay. It's a wizard thing. All right. All right. They yeah. were sent as equals, you know? Like, they were yes, sent they were. as five equals. It's just that four of them failed their task. <laughs> or they were sent as two who went out first and went far east and, you know. Yeah discovered the one of them discovered the joys of creating cults and the other one said you know that's a pretty bad idea and 
We might find that they destroy each other. <laughs> it kind of, I guess I, in my mind, I made the implication that, you know, they're both sent out east as if they went out together. But in this, they they, didn't, no. one went and then the other. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think that's a showrunner thing. Got it. There was an impression that the two traveled out to the east together. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, Great. And the, the, the sort of bottom line from a lore perspective is, they didn't quote succeed insofar as they weren't destroying Sauron, but they r- removed the possibility of other armies arriving from the east to aid Sauron and his his dirty work. So, mm-hmm. you know, it was the sort of a well, you know, we're going to die, but at least we prevented this and this and this. Ask any political field. campaign; it's hard to set up a field office, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And uh, and the the dark wizard tried to set up a field office, and I guess it probably is not going to work out for him. All well, I hope it isn't. Are left in the hands they were placed in. Placed in. Yeah, <laughs> great line. I absolutely love the way that Tom lights one candle on his chimney stack, and then they all light up mm-hmm. as well. That was a beautiful image and a wonderful conception. I just thought that was nifty. I'm very interested that the dark wizard actually met Tom. Mm-hmm. He says, you're not the first wizard to eat honey by my fire. Right. So, right. Was that when that wizard first arrived? And, you know, how did that conversation go? I mean, it, they're, they're, they're teasing us there with a whole lot of stuff, yeah. and I don't know if we'll ever see it or not. Well, does that have to do with Tom's function i mean we can talk a little bit about this more on the uh lore cast but you know they're they're sort of giving tom a job in this season of television because if he's if if the stranger has been you know directed here and tom is saying well we're gonna see if you're worthy of your name and your staff Mm -hmm. it's it's a it is a uh, uh, Yoda, Luke kind of situation where mm. you got to show me that you got the chops, and you know I'm gonna I'm gonna observe, and because Tom is uh, 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 like a, a non, like he doesn't uh, involve himself in the affairs of a lot of things, so he's kind of working as an observer role in in some way. So is that like giving the stranger a path? Uh, uh, um, somebody like, look, I can do it. Oh, like, oh, I can do what should I do with this magic or how should I do this? And and Tom's just kind of giving them these cryptic answers, but it, in mm-hmm. a way it's drawing the stranger to take actions and to learn and to grow in, in his, his role. Yeah. It's, it's the enigmatic sensei kind mm-hmm. of approach, mm-hmm. which I think is appropriate. I don't see Tom as a trainer of wizards. No. Right. I see him as a very potent force who, is only interested in things as they are. It was really weird when he took out the wax on and said, can you wax, wax my car or wax on my car? <laughs> <laughs> but he did tell him to wash Hopefully. his face and hands. So, What's the deal with the lamb? Glar- Glarwine? I, is, he named the lamb, picked it up, and... I think it was Irwin. Anyway, you've you've seen the things I haven't. Well, no, but I, I don't have the I, I don't have subtitles. So as as you know, so I, I was only hearing what I could hear, and I, I oh, okay. He named the lamb something. He though. did. He so, did. I guess we'll find out when we get subtitles. You know, one one thing. Go ahead, Marilyn. I just think it was a random indication of how Tom behaves. Okay. That he's interested in everyone and has no desire to dominate anyone. And if mm-hmm. you know a, a black wizard fresh from his Meteor came up, Meteorite came up to him and said, teach me the powers of darkness. And he's like, hey, doll, <laughs> Mary doll, here's my little lamb. Right. Um, and the Black Wizard said, right, fine. Because he, well, he is, knows of it, he calls him the hermit. Yeah. Is the, did the first wizard go, you know, eat honey with Tom, and then he went out and then he was corrupted? Or did, or was he, you know, like, when did the dark wizard become dark, right? When did, you know, when did yes. Sauron become sour? Yeah, you know, Sauron like, was good for a very long time. Right. Yeah, no, I, my understanding is that somehow in this time period that we have yet to see, the dark wizard as he is now encountered Sauron. Because and was he's, corrupted. And he's clearly the head of this cult. Mm. Right, and, right. Of course, of course, duh. Because the um, the White Wings are out looking for Sauron. Exactly. 
Exactly. So that they can join forces. And then Tom specifically says that if those two flames combine, then the world's going to burn. The world's going to burn. Mm. And we don't really know where the rumor started that the meteorite would be a sign that Sauron was going to return. Mm. And so remember, the the um, the three cultists initially thought that that was Sauron. Mm-hmm. You know, sign of his return. Well, it is his return, and that's why they were tracking it down and trying to find it and so forth. And then later on, found out that no, Just the it, wrong is, portent. it is the other. Mm-hmm. So again, someone somewhere knew that there would be a second wizard. Now maybe Tom Bombadil told that to the first wizard, and so he got set up for that. So, you know, they kept coding the stranger with this uh, eye motif, right? Which is partially designed to, you know, mislead us as to his identity. But mm-hmm. then I'm thinking about the opening sequence and there's that sun star, you know, that sun circle symbol mm-hmm. that we see mm-hmm. that we're thinking is Numenorian. What if that's relative to the East e star? Well, I thought that at least one of the sun signs was Relating to the east, to Rune, and so right. No, by but, extension, but, but there's that one. You know, do you remember which one I'm talking about? We don't have the image to look at together. Probably not. It's it's the one that we thought was Numenorian. Okay, that was ringed in red. Okay, the yeah, circle right. one. That, that's a star. Right, 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 I, right. I wonder if that's. I wonder if that's uh, something to do with the stranger and the east star and and whatnot, because they kept giving yeah. us that visual round eye shape for him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So could be, could be. So, I, I mean, to me, I'm just going to posit my theory here on what Tom is. This is something that I've thought about a long time, probably Go longer than most should. <laughs> I think he is the embodiment of the music of the Ainur. I think I that, is, that is who he is, and, exactly. and which is why he's able to interact without power over things, power in conjunction with things, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he is part of all creation. And that's yeah. why he's able to sing to Goldberry when she's not really there, right? Or is somehow able to be there in, you know, he's able to pull water. her in for a minute. Sure, why not? So yeah, and and I I think it's really interesting that in his, this scene we get clear statements that he has already been to the Withy Windle, which is where he was when he met the Hobbits. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Which is is very interesting to me because we were all thinking, oh, this is going to be before when we saw the trailer. This is going to be before he ever goes west. But now we know he has been west and he's come back east to check on things. And he could end up back there. He came. He out. will. He will end up back. <laughs> yeah. There. He will. Yeah. He came out because he heard that this place the that had been green was now dust. Right. And he's that's classic Bombadil because he's an observer. Right. He is not intended to try and make changes or to force anyone. That's just not what he does. He'll he'll tell stories, he'll point things out to you that should be obvious but aren't, right? <laughs> and and that's who he is, and that's great. I think we can dive into the nature of Bombadil more in our lore cast. Cool. But yes. uh there's there's a lot of really good stuff here. I think he bears a resemblance to Kirdan, actually, now that I think of it. Mm. They're both they're both contemplatives. Yeah. Hmm. So let's go back to near closer to the Withy Windle to the uh. Barrow Whites. Elrond and Galadriel's team wanders into the Barrow Downs, where ancient lords and kings are buried. The Barrow Whites awaken and attack. The team seems hopeless, but Elrond remembers that Barrow Whites can be defeated with the weapons they were buried with. One elf is killed. Galadriel implies that Sauron is awakening evil across Middle Earth. So I just want to say in this scene, Elrond makes a successful Arcana check. Uh, this scene is so oh, D&D. Yeah. This is such a D and D scene. It's so like. Hold on, let me roll. Let me roll for strength so I can lift up the, the <laughs> exactly lid to the tomb. <laughs> let me help, and that gives you a you know a, an extra die right for your roll. Nat twenty. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, that's what he rolled for his Arcana check. So I really. Can't wait for the episode proper to come out because I want to rewatch this scene. Yeah, um, it's hard without the subtitles. Well, but I'm thinking of the watermarking and the small screen. I want to see this on. Uh, sure. I want to see the detail because these barrel whites look great. The CGI looks amazing. I think they just did a very, very cool job. Uh, there were 
There was a little bit of Pirates of the Caribbean there too. Mm-hmm. Sure. There was a skull that got knocked back and then came forward. That's again. true. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're taking these visions from the ring and they're putting them right around, right? They're not delaying them. And I, I wondered how much are they kind of reacting to season one where they had they set up these season long, like, what if, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> and now they're like, now we're going to give you a vision at the beginning of the episode and then we're going to give you the play out in the, in the middle. I yeah, don't, I, yeah. They're not getting their hands burnt uh, by holding back. Well, it's well, also more, more Tolkienian because he's constantly spoiling himself for the Silmarillion. Mm, yeah. Also, there somebody had written in, I forgot who, but basically they were already they had already written season two before they yes. aired season one, basically. Right. Yes. So right. so yeah. a lot of this is just this is where they were at with the story. And, but I also uh, have a feeling they did a fair bit of um Yeah, I'm sure they always do editing. They always do. That and and I think not having the COVID restrictions like you brought up in the beginning, Marilyn, was a big deal. Uh, It has to have been. I mean, the Wheel of Time is the is the biggest casualty to COVID. I think uh, you know because they had to completely rewrite the finale uh, for a lot of reasons, and and so I'm not going to go deep into that. Go back to our Wheel of Time coverage if you want to hear about that, but. (laughs) But I, I think Amazon in particular seems to have suffered quite a lot from COVID production issues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, yes. go on. Yes, I got a, a couple of, of notes. Uh, a small technical detail. I heard uh, Elrond say the barding is from Linden. Yeah, and that uh, yeah. uh, barding or barb or bard is body armor for war horses. Right. And I kind of feel dumb for not picking up on the visual clues of the messengers getting captured by the chains in the previous episode. And I thought they were Uruk and... Oh! Yes. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> they got you okay. too. Yeah, we found out. We figured it Finally, out. Finally, yes. How could? How did anybody... Okay, yes. I feel so much better. Thank you, David. <laughs> totally thing, went over though, my head. One thing, though, it was not gloomy and ghostly. No, it was not. Pull away. It was not. Well, they were doing their best not to in any way hint at, but they dragged away bodies with chains. Yep. And I thought, what is that all about? Is this mm-hmm. their dinner? You know? Yeah. But uh, it yeah. It wasn't Sauron. Not directly. I knew it couldn't have been orcs. And I have to say, B D D F. Um, black dude dies first. Yeah. They killed the only black actor. Like, that's a whole separate issue, but I just oh. wanted to call it out. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a thing in, in television and movies. The uh, black right, dude right, dies. Right, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially in horror. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunate. Well, let's go back to the uh, search party for Arondir, who leads a search party through the forest to find Theo. When they return to Pelargir, Arondir figures out that Estrid is hiding her true identity as one of the wild men. He puts her in shackles and forces her to lead them to the rest of the wild men. Isildur feels betrayed as the trio sets out to find Theo, who is trapped in a tree with the wild men from the camp. Isildur falls into a sinkhole and Arondir falls in (laughs) after him. Estrid, free to escape, chooses to help him, uh, sorry, sorry, to help them, allowing them to slay one of the nameless things and go free. This nameless things was my favorite comic moment. Oh, really? Okay. Absolute spit take moment. Uh huh. There are many nameless things in the dark places of the world. This one we shall call supper. <laughs> yeah, that was that was great. <laughs> it was absolutely because it combined classic. a Tolkien quote with humor, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I gotta say, I, I mean, she was in a tight corner and kind of desperate, but. This is the first time that Estrid showed very little common sense and street smarts when she was trying to say, oh, yes, I was lying too close to the fire. <laughs> Your hair would have gone before that came anywhere near that mark. So yeah, I was on, curious how she was going to get herself out of that. Oh, one. crikey, Moses. Yep. Did, uh, I don't know, the, the when they were opening the aqueduct, speaking of Estrid, and mm. she forces the thing open, then he gets spit in the face. That whole scene read very sexual to me, and I don't know if that's just me. Of course, or, no, and no, it's with all a little right. role reversal stuff going on. And I was no, you're, just good. Like, you're good. Okay, just make sure. <laughs> it wasn't just you. <laughs> oh man, 
Uh, so quicksand, qu- shout out to quicksand, the bug, uh, the bugaboo of generation X. We all feared quicksand. Uh, we thought it was going to be around every corner and <laughs> we got some interesting in the John Mulaney why. had a bit about that, didn't he? Yeah. There's a whole bunch of, uh, co- comedians and other, you know, memes and stuff about it's like, I, I thought that was going to be a big concern in adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> Well, thank you for clarifying that for me, because I think this is the first time we encounter quicksand in Middle Earth. <laughs> yeah. Well, and a, a nameless thing w- of which seems like it's the, you know, not dissimilar to the Watcher in the Water outside the Moria Gate. Well, there, there's a quote, I forgot who says it, is it Aragorn or Legolas, who says, he's like, there are many nameless things. Basically what Arondir says in the Fellowship of the Ring says it. Far, far below the deepest delving of the dwarves, the world is gnawed by nameless, by nameless. things. That's Gandalf. Even Sauron knows them not. Yeah, They're that's older than he. Okay. Now I have walked there, but I will bring no report to darken the light of day. It's Gandalf 2.0. When he comes back as Gandalf the White, yeah. he's telling them what happened. Spoilers. Happens. Just kidding. Everybody <laughs> knows that. Everybody oh, knows sorry. about Wizard Jesus. <laughs> You 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 gotta at some point let go of. That. I know. I'm just kidding. The oh, Lord of the Rings is fair game. Purity. That's fair game. I would hope so. So, so yeah. Uh, so there's a whole class of monsters in in here of name that just fall into the nameless things, right? So I mean, I think it's really interesting that Tolkien takes that because that's a biblical thing too, right? That's that's something in Genesis. Oh, you yeah. see, they're yeah. like God created all these nameless things, and and then mm-hmm. uh, Leviathan. No, that's in Job. Sorry. Well, but but they, so there's all the nameless things in Genesis, and then yeah. you you then have people like HP HP Lovecraft <laughs> who then explore that idea, right? That there are nameless things in the depths, and and so this is it's a trope that I really like. Yeah, yeah. I, I would push back slightly on the HP Lovecraft, and I'm no no. Um, I think it's more of a um, a minor point, which is his thing came from his deep. Um, Deep-seated racism and xenophobia. Um, so yeah. it was mapped there, but I think it's still a, a, of, a, of a similar ilk of like, yeah. I mean, I, th- I think I think different. I think people have different influences, right? He can sure, he sure. can have his cat. Just don't look up the name, but he can also know his biblical history and yeah, yeah, yeah. No, too. I'm I'm not I'm right. not uh, I'm not trying to invalidate your point. I, I think I'll, I'll just add to it. So. No, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly I'm not defending the morality of H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, I think that whole no- notion of creatures in the deep, it doesn't matter what religion you are, if you're anywhere near a coastline, it's, it's yeah. going to be a thing. And we have to make sure that we don't judge the creation by its creator, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> right, Gil Gallant? <laughs> right, Kierdon, so, whoever said it? Score! Good call. <laughs> it, w- it was Kierdon. It was Kierdon, yeah. Yeah. Darren, insufferable. So is the big uh, shark whale creature um, in um, season one, and and of course in the episode one of this, is that a nameless? Would that fall into a nameless thing category? I'd put it there. I would too. Though of course they've given it a name by now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I think that's okay. right. And we can see that big long trail of of how it was moving. So I don't know. Was it if? Oh, what if? Well, no, they killed this one. So, hmm. Because what if this is comes up to a region and then plants itself at the, you know, at the outside of Moria? It just looks more like a slug to me. No, nah, okay. It looks like a yeah. Know, no, I don't. I don't think this species. is. I don't think this is that. This is a watcher in the water. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. I think there, there there are many nameless things, right? They, we were just told that. Fair enough. This one we this one we will call supper. Exactly. So let's go to the fate of the Harfoots. The leader of the stores announces that the Harfoots will be cast out at sunrise. Nori says Sadak Burroughs would have done the same thing, leading the store leader to show her their history. In ancient history, a store named Rory Mass Burroughs set out to find the Suzat, a land where the stores could settle. Nori says she does not think Rory Mass ever found the Suzat, as the Harfoots do not have a home. The raiders arrive to demand the Harfoots, but the leader covers for them. The raiders leave and vow to come back with the Dark Wizard. Interesting they didn't just say, right, we're going to trash your village until we find them. Yeah, exactly, right? Maybe they thought they couldn't fight off all those Harfoots at once. I don't know. 
Yeah, I think that Although was probably story, the, sorry. I'm so sorry. the only <laughs> explanation. I just loved not only the concept of making Roy Mass Burroughs' journey into the walking song, mm -hmm. but also the way, again, Bear used the melody in the music in this scene. It just the two of them together mm. were, were, were just incredibly beautiful. I didn't even pick up that that was a song in that scene. It absolutely was. That's nice. Completely different uh, orchestration, to call it that. Um, so how do but, we think that the Suzat is going to become the Shire in name? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, this, this Suzat sounds more like a runic term, so... I could you know. find no reference online to anything that was like Suzat, so... No, it's a, I think it's yeah, a show creation. A, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did you notice the big on on the big rock wall painting at the top of the painting is a big big tree? Cool. Yeah. It was too dark for me to see all the details imagery in the ceiling at that point. Yeah. 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 No. There's as part of their design is a is a big tree. So follow the trees. As follow they said. the trees. Although Rande was following the petals in this. That's true. Particular episode. That's but true. The petals came from the trees. So. Mm-hmm. I really do like this whole scene, though. I mean, for for me, at first, I was like, is Gund, who is the leader, moving too fast in her change of motivations? But then you're like, I don't think she really wanted to send them out at any point. You get the sense that she's yeah. much like Sadok Burroughs and that she's kind of rough on the outside, but has a tender heart. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think that's kind of when you're when you're dealing with a group like this and you need to rule them in a way where you can manage resources and not get caught. I think you just have to kind of be like that. And she, mm -hmm. she and Sadok both did that. Absolutely. That's exactly what Nori says. But I think she was so startled by that connection mm -hmm. that it kind of disarmed her entirely. And so the, her defenses were down and suddenly it's like, okay, you're not strangers. You know, you're great, 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 great grandnieces or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you buy that the last name stuck and that nothing ever changed and nobody ever married? Uh, they never only had a daughter who then took the last name of the other birth. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I'm a, I was a little bit like, wait, so you still have a Pathfinder with that same last name? How many hundreds or thousands of years later? Well, it worked for me. I'm not sure that it's thousands of years later. Yeah, probably hundreds. Because it's really hard for songs to last that long in, in such a similar form. Yeah, I think they would because, you know, if Burroughs is the trail finder, and that becomes not just a family, but a, a job, if you will, hmm. um, it's much more likely that they're going to keep those names and keep that... Um, tradition that you know mm. the two are the same thing and i think hobbits proto hobbits are going to have a lot of kids because of the hazards of life so i have no problems with them having that kind of a descent going down okay for so many years all right well i certainly laid the groundwork for the shire yeah i'll right. see you at the susat mm -hmm. <laughs> where it's easy to dig out a hole and what it was i forget what there was some sort of you could do it in a month or something, I think. Right, <laughs> right, right. I Which, think I'm going to uh, have to change the name of my occasional Patreon thing to uh, Suzat Shy Chats. <laughs> <laughs> you better practice saying it first, John. It's a <laughs> mouthful, even worse. Suzat than Shy. Su Su <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> exactly. <do it. laughs> even worse than Shire Side Chats. All right. Shall we move on to a new oath? Mm. Elrond and Galadriel debate whether the cost of victory will become too great. Elrond says Eärendil told him one day Celebrimbor's life would be in his hand. And that day has come, hasn't it? Yep. Yeah. Galadriel sees a vision of Sauron's crown. Uh, El Elrond being held at knife point by orcs. The statue of Feanor being pulled down in a region. Celebrimbor being shoved to the ground. And a dark-haired mannish Sauron. She asks Elrond to put the defeat of Sauron above all else, including her life. He makes the promise. One of the elves arrives to announce they have heard drums. So they 
have established that all of these ring vision things are going to happen very soon. So I, you know, these are these aren't big mysteries they're setting up. They're just straightforward. Yeah. Um, not even foreshadowing. Like this is highlighting. <laughs> this is what's going to happen. Yeah, it's almost as if they're warning people. Okay, the last three episodes are going to be terribly violent. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. We're going to have a battle. You were to beware. Right, and then and hopefully, well, you know, if if uh, we'll see how the season goes. But sometimes, you know, ending um, a, a season on a downbeat, like <gasps> what will happen to our heroes next season? You know, that kind of stuff. Well, you know, I will throw up on the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Satisfy a plot line. I think they will. I think yeah. they will. I really do. Well, they'll give us enough satisfied plot lines. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. that if I do tease something else for the next time, I mean, you know, um, Calrissian heading off into the stars to to bring Han back in mm -hmm. the, at the end of season two. I mean, classic ending. So this is where we get more of this um, development of Galadriel saying that she's always felt these premonitions, but now she can see them. Yes. Which is a wonderful way of pointing back to the lore, which says that these rings will enhance the abilities that you already have. Mm. Hobbits get a little Heidi, and mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, Galadriel gets a little CE. And uh, as I said, I can absolutely see in this the early seeds of the Lady of Lorien, and not just in the visions, but in this exchange, right between the two of them, you know. Let's figure out what our priorities are here. And if we have to use a flawed instrument to bring about positive outcome, you know, why are you so resistant to that? Mm -hmm. And Elrond equally is, is there no point at which the cost of victory becomes too great? Well, interestingly, that is kind of also going to be the question for Numenor. And and we've already heard Mir, uh, Miriel and Elendil in the first season exchanging their views of what it means to be one of the faithful and being willing to pay the price, however great. So they're kind of playing with those themes, not just between Elrond and Galadriel, but maybe for all the different peoples of Middle Earth. Mm. Yeah, I do. I do like that. Elrond swore an oath here because he's so anti-oath in the Third Age. Yes. And I and I have a feeling that's going to be part of it. Mm. Could be. Could be. I mean, he's already... That was the basis of his childhood, of course. Um, seeing... Having been brought up by Mithros and right. his brother and seeing the horrible ravages that that oath must have taken. Hmm. Yeah. And in... Oh, where is it? Both in season one and in this season, she's there's there's a lot of promises passing between Elrond and Gladrail. There's something right. because oh, I'm trying to remember now. I had it in a note somewhere. I think something. I think it was in season one. He says to her, like, "Oh, you know, I won't not trust you again. Like, you have my trust. He does. I should have trusted you yes. before. I promise I will never make that mistake again. So yeah. he's making promises. He's making a lot of promises. And then later on, towards the end of the series, you know, he starts to question her, and she says, "Do you remember that promise you made?" And right. He says, "You're you're making it very hard for me." To yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Funny. And he breaks it. He has broken it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. He's absolutely broken it at this point. So. And doesn't he make a, some promises with Durin as well? Namarie. Hmm. I can't, I'm trying to remember now. Anyway, uh, Elrond is... I'm not sure is, that he did. A lot of people, like Elrond, a lot of people depend on Elrond. Like, dude, you got. I got to trust you. You got to do this thing. Like, you know, you yeah, got to be my yeah. voice. You got to do this. Like, he's a really pivotal character. He, he is. absolutely is. And this is why it distresses me so much that he's basically become an absolutist. Mm. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, look, Galadriel has her flaws, too. You ever watch <laughs> oh, How I Met Your Mother? Has. a few. You of ever watch your, How I Met Your Mother where uh, they, ha they have this whole thing where they go, you owe me and no questions asked. And so if they ever get into like a really sticky situation, like one gets like stuck in a mailbox, like a postal box or something <laughs> like that. They're like, it's a no questions asked. You can't ask me how I got here. <laughs> and I feel like Galadriel's going around to everyone saying, you owe me a no questions asked. Mm. <laughs> and it's yeah. just not going to work for her because no one else is asking for one in return. Yeah, I mean, she's definitely not defying her king now. 
as she was in the first season. Mm -hmm. So that much has changed for her. Mm -hmm. But the whole business about oaths, um, it, it's it's um, it's a challenge because it implies. Okay, sometimes I'm going to lie to you, but if I take an oath, I won't lie. <laughs> Which is why in Quaker tradition, we don't do oaths, mm. because we're supposed to always say what is true. Now, we don't have to say all the truth or whatever. I mean, you know, obviously, people can be very shifty about that, too, and never actually tell a lie. But it just got me thinking about that whole concept of why does an oath make it different? Mm. If you are not trustworthy to begin with, why should I trust your oath? Yeah, and there's some there's some good stuff that goes back. I'm trying to remember now. I'm trying to claw back some freshman college courses on on literature <laughs> and stuff. Um, about was it Oedipus stuff or was it Gilgamesh stuff? About you know your name and the only thing you have is your name and your word. Your word is your bond. And if you yeah. break your word, if you break your oath, mm -hmm. you that is that is going against so many things in society because if we can't what's your name what's right. your lineage who are you from and then you mm -hmm. give me your word about something now you're fixed within society and if you if any of that is a lie or you break that you've now broken a fundamental compact of you know, human society and and grave with grave consequence yeah there's there are some cultures have this tradition of you know, classification. And if you are of an upper class, then one of the signals of that is that you do not lie. Mm. Then you have the Anglo-Saxon concept of, okay, there's two people, they have a disagreement. Each of them brings to the hearing their supporters. Mm -hmm. And one by one, you know, these supporters stand up and say, I know this person, I know that he speaks right. the truth, and therefore I trust what he says. And, you know, if you brought six and your other opponent brought ten, well, you know, that might actually sway the decision <laughs> of who's telling the truth. And there's also a magic tradition that says your magic is only as strong as your word. Mm. And so if you're somebody whose word is mm, kind of soft, then you may not be able to do whatever you want to do as effectively. Which brings us back around to Earthsea. Yes. And the power of names. Mm -hmm. And the need to know as many names as possible mm. in order to enact that particular mm. power that we call magic. Well, let's take a quick break. When we get back, we will finish up the episode. And we're back. The last couple scenes we've got here, uh, the first one is Meet the Ents. <laughs> Erondir gives the key to Estrid's shackles to Isildur to decide whether to free her. He does, and Estrid immediately takes his sword and tries to escape. Erondir knocks an arrow to stop her, but they're interrupted by an Ent attack. Erondir and Isildur <laughs> talk... Are you? Would you like to share with the class? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ent attack. Arondir and Isildur talk the end and end wife down and meet Winterbloom. The Ents tell them of an orc army traveling through Middle Earth and deliver Theo back to them. Isildur and Estrid almost share a kiss before her betrothed wild man Hagen finds her. Arondir and Theo embrace and both set off on their respective missions. Did I get that name right? That's what I heard. I, I repeated it a couple times. I was like, Winter Bloom, right? That sounds right, John. I think that was the name of the Ent Wife. Okay. I think so. That was the only named one I thought. I didn't, I didn't hear yeah, the, no, I didn't. the Ent. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Where are you guys at with the uh, introduction of Ents? We had t Bombadil and Ents. Like, this is kind of a huge episode. And Barrow Whites. And Barrow Whites, <laughs> right? Which was more of a... Oh, you know, my. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I'm good with the ends. They okay. you know, they've obviously been around a long time. I I like when 
you know, there's a whole thing where Treebird asks the hobbits, oh, well, your Shire sounds a lot like what the Entwives used to like. And so mm -hmm. have you seen any of them? I mean, this isn't quite by the Shire, but, you know, just, just them being in a different area with the Ents. I, I, it's interesting to see that in the Second Aids, they are still together, the Ents and the Entwives. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting choice. And I'm still wondering why they did that. They're, what I heard in this episode is the two of them had taken responsibility for protecting that particular forest. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little vague on which one it is and where it is, but I'm afraid it's going to get completely eradicated in the future by certain sea people. But <laughs> yeah, we'll see. to me, they we'll are, see. to me, they are leading us towards some kind of division between the Ents and the Entwives where the Entwives want vengeance against the orcs. Mm, uh, and, and the Ents themselves are very passive and they want to stay by the forest and rebuild. And it's just two mm. different paths that each one wants to take and they just never find each other again. Hmm. Yeah, that would be very interesting to see them work that out in that particular fashion. I found it absolutely heartbreaking when... Oh, Rondir had to confess to having cut down Livic Wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was and a was whole a big thing, right? Wonderful callback mm -hmm. to that scene in the orc trenches in season one, where he apologizes to the tree before he starts chopping. Mm, I forgot about that. Yeah. 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 No, it really it it was heartbreaking. And he's from Greenwood the Great, which becomes Mirkwood. Yes, that's Legolas's hood, right? And, and Thranduil and all, yeah. And he's was, got that armor uh, that looks like an Ent on his, you yeah. know. Yeah, it's interesting that neither of the Ents mentioned that. Maybe they just weren't paying attention. So, what they did pay attention to, excuse me, David, they did pay attention to the fact that he spoke Elvish, and so okay, Elf. Right, yeah. and I guess uh, uh, the the Ents didn't wholly work for me, and maybe maybe there's some lore things if I had a little bit more. I just. Maybe I've got Jackson's ints in my head, you know, with the, the deep, low voice and the slow talking. I wanted the ints to be a bit more vocally present in the show. Um, hmm. And I guess I don't know enough about ent wives to really understand the relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, not many people do. Nobody These does. Two, nobody does. Okay, nobody fair does. enough. But I, I think it would make a lot of sense if they were faster talking, faster moving, quicker to anger. Too. And they were, you know, more vengeful, and that's just that's what divided them. I think okay. that that's actually good storytelling. Yeah. Okay, okay. The thing, the thing I liked best about them is they were not figures of fun. We weren't supposed to laugh at them. Mm -hmm. They didn't yeah. look mm -hmm. ridiculous. Okay, they genuinely they looked, looked great. like creatures who you could mistake for trees, mm -hmm. and at the same time, to my mind, they were very entish. Mm, okay. And what they had to say was good. I mean, it was also interesting that the ant wife talked a lot more than the ant did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of like he knew that she was she was definitely on a mission. Mm -hmm. And they were a couple, and so he is supporting her in this. So, again, John's notion of, of the ant wife being extra protective I find very interesting. Okay. I, I think from because of what the lore says, I expected to first meet an ant wife in some kind of a garden setting. But it could be at this stage in the proceedings, the gardens have all been destroyed. Mm. And she's already going out and hunting wild men and orcs. Right. Because they've been chopping down trees, mm -hmm. living trees. So I, that she raised from seed. Mm. Would would a Ron deer have he, he certainly knows about Ents and knows sort of the right protocols. But I was just wondering if he had ever, and I couldn't find anything really online about Greenwood, Mirkwood, Ents, you know, where Ents are to be found and, and that kind of stuff. And, and so I was just kind of, I was looking to, for a Ron Deer to be a little bit more, I guess, um, have a little bit more protocol orientation towards them, like saying certain forms and bowing in certain, you know, sort of kowtowing in the right way. Mm. He still he he still calms them and unlocks them. He still knows how to mm -hmm. handle the situation. Mm -hmm. I guess I was looking for a little bit more ceremonial formality to to his interaction, but that's a well, me th maybe that's a me thing. 
It might have been there if, you know, she wasn't about to get strangled. Right, yeah, I think he might have been caught off guard there. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. fair yeah. point. Yeah. And I think he handled the situation beautifully. I mean, he spoke very slowly. Mm -hmm. And calmly and, and, yeah. Gently. Mm -hmm. And touch. It was very important to come into physical contact. Yeah, I, I was wondering and, about that. Yeah, very tactile. Mm. Um, which... I think it's harder to be in opposition to someone who has actually been touched in a gentle way. Mm -hmm. Obviously, not in a you know, punch your nose or even pokey you know, pokey pitch, way. Yeah, pokey pokey way. As far as where the ants are located, it's an interesting question because they say at one point you know there was this whole massive forest, but I think the um, misty mountains coming down the middle, mm -hmm. uh, Aglier, as the as the elves would say, seems to have been something of a dividing line, mm -hmm. but. Treebeard has said that one at one point a, an ant could walk all the way from Region to Linden, mm -hmm. and it was one long forest. So, and wasn't there a line in this where it's like I've tended these forests since before right. the mountains split the garden in two? Oh, oh, excellent! Yes, you're right. Was it in this Absolutely episode? Right. Oh, yeah, it was in yes, this it was. The mountains oh, okay. split, and on a lore basis, it was Morgoth who raised up the Misty Mountain chain oh. to interfere with the riding of Orme. Oh. And of course, subsequently it became a barrier for the all of the elves who were migrating to Valinor. Mm. So that's, that's a good catch, John. I like that. Nice. Yeah, these guys know their lore, don't they? Oh, they know their lore. They absolutely do. So, Theo, did Theo just become Lord of Palangir? <laughs> I'm, I have the same question, David. I, I, I how was can very Theo confused be Lord by of that. Here? Unless El, uh, unless Elrondir has some foresight going on here, but uh, which then sort of feeds all of the the rumors and theories about what you know will Theo become something in future? Right. Um, again, it could easily lead to him becoming the King of the Dead or, or Nazgul. Nazgul. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I hope he doesn't become that. <laughs> I was just so glad that they had this reconciliation. Mm -hmm, I, it mm -hmm. just, I was really, really glad. And, and appropriate to their characters, you know? They weren't weeping on each other's shoulders. Or mm -hmm. like that. He comes it was in, he's a like, Dad! Hug. <laughs> right, no. No, but, you know, just this basic statement of thank you for keeping your promise. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. their promises again. You know, and of course... Bronwyn is hanging hanging between them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But doesn't get name checked because you know that's not what these people do. Right, that's not what these two people do. So, yeah, I mean, I guess it's a question of state. Watch this space to see what happens. Alrighty, well, I, listeners, I, well, if you have any ideas, <laughs> write in. Yeah, I mean, I, I know there was some chatter on the the Discord about Theo, and yeah, what he's. And if if you go to certain parts of the internets, there's lots of conversations about Theo's future. So oh sure, yeah. I mean that's been going on. <laughs> yeah, know, since last since episode. the beginning, yeah. that first time we saw yeah. him in season one. Yep. Well, why don't we go back to Galadriel? Yes. Team Elf spots the orc army, and none of the elves is shot. Sorry, one of the elves is shot with an arrow. <laughs> uh, Galadriel heals the wound with the power of Nenya then gives the ring to Elrond and tells him to take the other elves back to Linden to tell Gil-galad to send the armies to Eregion instead of Mordor. Mm -hmm. Galadriel holds her own against the orc army until Adar captures her. Elrond mm -hmm. says she protected the ring, not them. And golly, don't I hope he just thinks he'll pitch it into the nearest pond. <laughs> well, this is their second meeting now. Right, because she captured our him. Galadriel, yeah. 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 Yes. And wow, am I ever looking forward to some of the things that I saw in teasers and um in stills. There were there was one still in particular that I saw and I said, Holy cow. Mm, I don't think I've seen that one. So I wonder if what I think is gonna happen is happening. Okay, cool. So I didn't know how it was gonna happen, but I did know that she was gonna wind up in his hands. Are you guys liking the new Adar? I think he's doing yeah. a good job. It's about yeah, the same. Yeah, he's fine. Yeah. He's fine. I, I, yeah. I like him. I, in some ways, I like him a little bit better. Uh, oh, yeah? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, he's, a, he's got a little bit more of a subtlety. His, the, I, and I, I apologize, I don't remember the actor's names. Um, but the previous actor 
there was a little bit more of a bigness to his role, the way his... That his was Joseph Mall. Joseph Mall. Thank you. And this is Sam Hazeldine. So Hazeltine has a, a more there's a, he's he's more subtle and he's a little bit more of a flat affect, which I think for me works better in his sort of evilness because he's not crazy. Ha 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 ha. I'm not saying the other guy was, but there's just this yeah. very cold, calculating methodicalness. So I'm liking it. And he is all about protecting his children until the name Sauron comes up, mm-hmm. and then all bets are off. It's got to be, we have to destroy Sauron, because I saw what he did. Right. And I saw his power, and we were very fortunate to escape it the first time. Right. Right. And what do you think about this whole idea that Elrond is saying, oh, well, she protected the ring, not us? He's being a jackass. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's just, (laughs) you know, he is trying so hard to not feel the part of him that is saying, this is my dearest friend who saved my life Mm -hmm. when I was a child. It's, it's the grief of how can you disagree with me when I feel this so strongly? I thought you were my best friend. It's, it's a genuine fear, I suppose. Um, And yet, as Kirdan says in the beginning, you know, these are the people you trust the most who are taking on, this risk. I mean, I don't think any of the ring bearers doesn't believe that having a ring is a risk. But they're also saying this is power and we're going to need some kind of power beyond what we've had before Mm -hmm. in this circumstance. And being aware that they can be dangerous is about the closest you can come to using them safely. Mm. I don't think... Elrond can be being a jerk here, but he's also not wrong. No, but that's the thing. Neither of them are wrong. Mm-hmm. It's the paradox. Mm-hmm. You know, both of them are correct. And yet, you cannot go forward with both of them being correct all the time. There has to be some kind of give and take, the flexibility. Elrond is being completely inflexible. And I've all right, admit right. And like that, John said, he's playing opposites. That gets up my nose more than anything else. I just, <laughs> I do not like absolutely. He's just going, nah, ab- every time she talks. <laughs> yeah. The, the only, the only time I would say that, uh, you know, the only absolute is that there are no absolutes. And so that's the paradox. Right. But also Galadriel seems to be putting a lot of faith in her visions without questioning whether they were put there. Do you think so? I'm not sure. I th- I think she's I think she's receiving him in a way that says I have to sift this. I don't know. She has the vision on the bridge and then she goes, "We got to go that way right now." Well, <laughs> yeah, well let me ask you if she didn't have the ring, you still trusted her intuition before, I assume. I don't know about that at this point. I think the okay. the fact that she has been corrupted by Sauron at one point he is now wary of the influence that Sauron has on her mind. With ring or no ring. I wouldn't go so far as to say that she was corrupted. She was certainly deceived by Sauron. That's, well, that's what I mean. I, th- I think the tendrils of Sauron are within her mind. He, he has a lot of reason to distrust her because she was on the boat to Valinor and turned away. And they were, and like he said, he is, you know, he is... Um, taking advantage of what is already in you, right? You know, so you you already have a darkness within you and he's using that. And so his whole, he's, I think he's questioning his whole trust in her. But we all have that darkness in us, David. Uh, and well, Galadriel tell that to Elrond. Become, no, not <laughs> if you're Elrond, <laughs> Mr. Perfect saying. Son of Aar- 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 and Elwing. Uh, right. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. Oh, Remus. <laughs> no, it, you know, Galadriel has the knowledge of how close she came mm. to darkness. Mm-hmm. Elrond goes, ever is, been to Gondolin? <laughs> yeah. And that is the best possible defense against trespassing into that. Mm. When you've come that close and stepped back. Which? I don't know how close Elrond has come to darkness at this point. He may come to it. That's a good in, point. In this season. Yeah, yeah. And recognize that an inflexible stance on just about anything ultimately is not going to serve you. It makes me think of the scene in the Jackson movie where Frodo wants to give her the ring. 
Yeah, sure. And she comes right up and then turns away. Right. And that takes enormous strength and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see her developing now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be fascinated to see how the showrunners imagine the conversations between herself and Adar and what comes mm -hmm. of all that. Yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be juicy. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. It was cool to see uh, Morfid Clark do some badass shit. <laughs> oh, my Lord. <laughs> yeah, fantastic choreography here. Yeah. I mean, when she lays down on the horse and starts shooting <laughs> arrows around, I was like, come on, that's awesome. Yeah. Shoots yeah. fire Double arrows into the sky, yeah. rains fire down on them. I mean, you truly see the fire of Anoldo mm. in rage, right? Mm. I, yes. And I think yes. that's very, very cool. You can see oh, how, man. you know, it wasn't the Noldor, it was the, um, uh, what am I trying to say here? The Vanyar, the Vanyar came with the with the Valar to right. fight against Morgoth. You can definitely see how elves were able to fight against Morgoth. Mm -hmm. You can see the way Fingolfin went toe to toe with Morgoth and wounded him. Right, sure. I, I, they are, sure. these are powerful beings. And you can see how Luthien confronted Morgoth in his own dungeon. Right, but she wasn't using the weapons of power over. Unless you call a sleep spell power over, which I suppose it is. But. And and Finrod had a battle of Sa a song with Sauron. So, yeah, I mean, these yeah, elves are yeah. really powerful. They are able to go up against divine beings and mm -hmm. not fully fail. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the ring has uh, some even more magic powers we see here. She is able to. She's able to heal. Heal. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, intuition, healing, all of those things are what we eventually see in the fully formed Galadriel and in Morian. And cool. for $99.99 a month, you too can have <laughs> Nenya, the Ring of Power. <laughs> yeah, I really love it anytime action shows give us scenes in which the power that is usually used to shoot arrows and kill people is also used to heal. Mm, yeah. I like, I like that balance. Well, and she's doing the... All of that um, uh, ass kicking without the ring on, right? Right. That's true. Because that's She's not just the nature that of the ring. Mm -hmm. It's not the nature of the. She'd ring already given it to that. Elrond, and she's still a right. badass. Yeah. Yep. She's just Absolutely. a Noldo in rage. Mm. And the qualities of Nenya, the Ring of Water, also of adamant. You know, those qualities of intuition, healing, and so forth are traditionally associated with the element of water in a lot of magical systems. Mm -hmm. Tolkien knew him his lore. Cool. All right. Well, great episode. My favorite yet. I know, mm -hmm. I know not universal opinion on this podcast, but I, I had a great time, and I'm really looking forward to episode five, which I definitely haven't watched yet. <laughs> I definitely haven't watched a lot of it yet. <laughs> I've been, I have been pure. I oh. just haven't had time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> episode okay. four left me so want, uh, wanting for more. I was like, I gotta, I gotta watch some episodes. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know how yeah. you're processing the the guide so fast, man. It's like taking. It took me like three hours to do my notes yesterday, or and and three hours Golly. the day before. It took me like two days to process this episode. I do one watch through for enjoyment and then another watch with the guide. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm I do the best. opposite. My first watch, I take all my notes, and then my second watch, I'm watching okay. Lucy for a I, I did that but for Andor. I'll still take down notes as mm -hmm. they occur to me the second time around because there's things you miss, obviously. I did that with Andor. I couldn't not watch a scene and not take. Uh, five pages of notes, and then I then I would go back and watch for enjoyment after. And then we had some three hour podcasts on thirty minute episodes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, by the way, one ritual you didn't mention yet. We see an elf grave with the sword. Oh yeah, that was good. Thrust into it. Mm, okay. For a second, I was like, "Is that glam drink?" Because it was similar art. And then I looked at. I, I realized I was like, "No, nah, this can't be glam drink." There's, there's no, no because way. this is a gondolin. Away. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Not. Gandalf's sword here. No. So um, I want to do some programming notes. We do have an announcement to make. I want to talk about on here. On the feedback podcast, we will have some uh, introductory remarks about Rings of Power from Mark from a new podcast that we're going to be hosting called Nevermind the Music. 
Mark and Nicole are going to be hosting the that podcast. It is a new affiliate. We're really excited to have them. David, do you want to talk about them a little bit? Cool. Uh, I'll, I'll say that when they contacted us and they gave us some um, some access to some of their shorter episodes, you know, these little, um, they have longer episodes and then they have some shorter in-between ones. All three of us were like, oh, <laughs> these people are us. <laughs> this, is our, uh-huh. this is our kind of show. It's like, take a song and do a lorehound treatment on it and go into like psychology or go into mythology and then, but also go into the chord structure and why these chords resonate in this particular way and how that plays into Jungian psychology. Yeah, it is awesome. Fantastic stuff. And it is so well produced. Mark is an amazing engineer and producer. He's an actual uh, college professor teaching music, musicology. I'm not sure what his, his stuff is. Um, and well, musicology is a whole is a whole thing. Now you're mixing up some terms here. Dude. All right, I am. I'm not. I'm, I'm talking outside of my lane. So, uh, but we're really excited. They're great people. Mark's been listening for to Lorehounds for a while and some other uh, podcasts. And um, when they they were just like, "Hey, we need some advice," and we we're like, "You should become a Lorehound affiliate." <laughs> <laughs> they're like, whoa, "Whoa, okay." They're they're really great, Mark and Nicole both, and I'm excited to hear more from them. I've got we you know we've had the delight of getting a sneak peek at some of their content, but it sounds like they are going to be starting next week. So keep an eye on that feed. Never mind the music. I will put it in the link tree in the show notes, so you can find okay. it now. And start subscribing. You, they have a little teaser on there now, so you can listen to their voices for the first time. And then, like I said, Mark has put together some bits for the Rings of Power feedback episode. So tune into the feedback episode, and you'll hear all his goodness there. Yep, and uh, a lot more coming. So they've, I think they've like re, pre-recorded. Uh, they have like a ton ready to go. So it's going to be really exciting. Yeah. Good. Um, I don't know exactly what Alicia is putting out this week, but I know we have more coming on the Star Wars Canon Timeline podcast. You know, she's been recording with Marilyn on yes, the myths yes. of it's the myths of the old republic. Is that the topic? Basically, yeah. There's there's myths and even more, there's legends, and some of them focus specifically on a particular Sith Lord, and there's even one sort of folktale type style story, and uh, yeah, a lot of different very cool. Different and interesting stuff. Very cool. And Alicia is continuing her Wool Shift Dust book club. Now, on the Lorehounds Patreon Supercast feeds, now these are the recurring subscriptions only, you will be getting shortly the V for Vendetta yep. 11 Zs that we recorded. So we, it was honestly like an hour and a half breakdown of the movie. It was kind of a full breakdown of the movie. <laughs> but it was it was a lot of fun. Alicia went really hard on it. She read the graphic novel for it. So, oh yeah, it was really great podcast. I thought we we pulled out a lot of really cool themes on fascism and and totalitarianism and whatnot and and how the movie was made kind of American instead of British like it was in its source material. So very interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. I hope I just everyone will tune in. Finished the edit and listened to, to the edit. And it's a really good conversation. It was I'm, I'm really pleased with the episode. So it'll be out shortly. We went deep on it. Lighthearted topics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> By the Only way, trauma for, and fascism. <laughs> right. By the way, for Alien Romulus, we finally have a recording date. Yay. We're going to be recording on the 14th, uh, and then it'll be out after that. But I think we've got Ron, Jean, and Alicia, and myself. Mm-hmm. So that should be a good one. So mm-hmm. Very cool. It just took a while to get schedules realigned post-summer, you know, whatnot. Oh, yeah. It's hot for the summer, right? Isn't that the new kids song? Is it? Isn't that what they do? Chapel Roan? Don't know. Is that not the right? Is that not the right lyric? I don't know. Somebody write in. Tell me what Chapel Roan does. All I would thought it was Fellowship Fall, which is eminently appropriate if we're getting a new affiliate. (laughs) It is Fellowship Fall. Yeah, I'm. I'm super happy to to finally be able to talk about. Never mind the music. We've been sitting on this one for a bit. Uh So uh, I've got authorization from Mark today to talk about it. So very exciting. Yay. All right, everyone, go listen to other podcasts. Go listen to more of our podcasts, whatever you want to do. For now, we have thank yous to give. David, I'm going to hit you with some music. Are you ready? I am uh, ready. Go. Nice. Jazzy. Piano. Discord server boosters. Gnarls. 
Aaron K., Tiller the Thriller, Dork of the Ninjas, Doof 71, Captain Jinji 56, Athena Agilea, Adrian, Tina, and Lestu all support the server by giving us their little Discord bit things, and that makes a better environment for us to have more emojis and other kinds of cool features. To our Lore Master subscribers, there are top tier. They really uh, are the lifeblood of this podcast. Samartian, Michael G, Michelle E, David W, Brian P, SC, Peter O H, Bettina W, Adam S, Nancy M, Doov seventy one, Brian eighty sixty three, Frederick H, Sarah L, Gareth C, Eric F, Matthew M, Sarah M, DJ Miwa, Andra B. Kong Yu, Deadai Jedi Bob, Nathan T, Alex V, Aaron T, Sub Zero, Aaron K, Dally V, Mothership 61, Gnarls, Kathy W, Lestu, Jeffrey B, Elisa Yu, and forever last, never least, Adrian. Thank you all so very much for your ongoing support. We couldn't do this podcast without you. No matter how you listen, no matter how you subscribe, we're just glad you're here. Thanks for being a. Um, a lorehound listener in all thank forms. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In all fashions. Thank you, everyone. We will see you on the feedback pod. Bye. The Lorehounds podcast is produced and published by The Lorehounds. You can send questions and feedback and voicemails at thelorehounds.com slash contact. Get early and ad-free access to all Lorehounds podcasts at patreon.com slash the Lorehounds. Any opinions stated are ours personally and do not reflect the opinion of or belong to any employers or other entities. Thanks for listening.